And once again, as I did yesterday, I would just like to remind myself and, and you on the, uh, uh, the mystery of light and how beautiful it is to see over the mountain or anywhere. And to continue with this metaphor that um, I brought in yesterday of a cave, that if we go into a cave on the beach or carved out of a mountain, it's dark, we can't see anything, we need a light. And the metaphor of my mind being spaces where I really don't know. And so that light of observation, of attention, awareness, in my relationships with other people, animals, plants, you know, can tell me something important about myself and can help me understand what I am without judging it, praising it, blaming it, just looking. And sometimes that look is foggy because I'm always uh, got that conditioning in the background. But there are moments when the light is crystal clear. Another metaphor I think that might help is a tree in winter, bare, exposed, all of its leaves gone, standing as it were naked against the, the blue sky. So this process of understanding oneself is indeed a stripping away of what holds us back from a full and happy life, a peaceful life. <laughs> and of course, there comes a time when the tree blooms. There is a flowering with the work of self-awareness. Now, Krista Murdy, there is something strange and holy when the sun arises. There is a prayer, a chant to the dawn, to that strange, quiet light. So session two, can we create a totally different society? Understanding the dynamics of fear and authority in ourselves and in the world. I think this is the, these two twin, twin headed monsters as it were, are things that have to be understood. It says you can't find the new way without letting go of the old. Be a light to yourself, a light that has no dependence on another and that is completely free. It's the light which comes through the understanding of yourself. And meditation is not for the immature. By immature, age is not implied here. What is implied, I think, is that it's hard work. And it requires not only our attention, but a 
a seriousness of purpose, even a mission to understand myself. And then by extension, understand the kind of world I'm living in. So what stands in the way of being a light to ourselves? What blocks our fundamental wish to be happy and at peace? to live free of conflict, division, violence, poverty, and perpetual war. In the confusion of conditioning, we can't see what is true. That's me, that, you know, anything in quotations is of course, Krishnamurti. He says, it is as though we are attempting to see the clear, pure light through colored glasses, which we are unaware of wearing. To see the pure light, we must first be aware of our colored glasses. This awareness, if the urge to see the pure light is strong, helps to remove the colored glasses. A veil, we see through a veil that we have the capacity to unveil. So the journey into the light of wisdom it is possible to go on this journey only when there is the light which comes through the understanding of yourself and that light cannot be given to you by another. No master, no guru can give it to you, nor will you find it in the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, or in any other book. You may find descriptions of it, but the point is to find it for ourselves. Mr. on the understanding of authority and fear, there are implications for ourselves in the world. Can we be free of these pervasive influences? He said, I do not think we sufficiently realize the necessity of being free of this compulsion to follow authority, inward or outward. And I think it is very important psychologically to understand this compulsion. Otherwise, we shall go on blindly struggling in this world in which we live and have our being, and we shall never find that other thing which is so infinitely greater. We must surely break away from this world of imitation and conformity if we are to find a totally different world. And I think this world of imitation and conformity really affects young people more than ever. You cannot be a light to yourself if you are in the dark shadows of authority, of dogma and conclusion. He said the human being is heavily conditioned by the culture it lives in, by its traditions, its economic condition and by its religious propaganda. The mind which has created such havoc in the world is basically frightened of itself. It is aware of the materialistic outlook of science, its achievements, its increasing domination over the mind. And so it begins to put together a new philosophy. The philosophies of yesterday give place to new theories, but the basic problems of man remain unsolved. I just happen to think of, you know, artificial intelligence and where we're going with that. Again, some of it will be useful, no doubt. But if we don't understand ourselves, there is a real serious downside to it as well. So is it possible to break away from this whole pattern of authority? Can we break away from all authority of any kind in ourselves? We may reject the authority of another, but unfortunately we still have the authority of our own experience, of our own knowledge, of our own thinking. And that in turn becomes the pattern which guides us. But that is essentially no different from the authority of another. 
I think this is really uh, another deep dive on what authority inside myself is driving my daily life that I'm not even aware of. So where do we begin in this inquiry? He says, to go far, you must begin very near. But to begin near is very difficult for most of us because we want to escape from what is, from the fact of what we are. I think this sense of escaping is another deep well. The curious ways we find to escape from our daily life, from what we see going on in the world. It's hard to face this. So look into the things that are very close to us, which is our daily life with all its misery, conflict, pain, suffering, love and anxiety, greed, envy, and all that. Questioner. You do not lay down any mode of conduct. You, why don't you do this? Most of us definitely need one. Krishnamurti. Why do you want a mode of conduct? If we can be a light unto ourselves, why do we want someone else to lay down the rules of behavior? The question is not, why don't you lay down a mode of conduct, but, why, but rather, can we be a light to ourselves under all circumstances? Though we may fail, though we may make mistakes, isn't it possible to be a light unto ourselves and not look to another? not seek authority of any kind to tell us what to do. You know, to me, this is such a breath of fresh air. And uh, it's one of the things I, I admire so much about Krishnamurti. Find that light within yourself which means that you must inquire into yourself. And this inquiry is hard work. No one can lead you. No one can teach you how to inquire into yourself. One can point out that such inquiry is essential, but the actual process of inquiring must begin with your own self-observation. Now, this is a, uh, I think for all of us, this looking, there is a sense sometimes of disequil disequilibrium. Well, how do I look? What am I looking at? So if we take this image for a minute, and you see two walkers walking, taking a walk in winter and coming in their direction are two other walkers with a dog on the leash some point they're going to cross paths there's going to be some kind of an interaction even if it's just a nod or a smile or maybe not <laughs> so in our daily life we are walking past people all the time we are coming upon each other all the time and that is that moment when attention and some kind of inquiry can happen in this relationship between ourselves and someone else, and in this case, their dog. It's just a way of trying to visually capture a moment of connecting with another human being. So just to say it again, the actual process of inquiring 
into the authority that I'm ruled by or anything else must begin with your own self-observation. Why do we accept most forms of authority? We all want to accept somebody who promises something because we have no light in ourselves. But nobody can give you that light, no guru, no teacher, no savior, no one. We have accepted many authorities in the past. We have put our faith in others and they have exploited us or utterly failed. Nobody can give you the light that never dies. The first thing to understand about this inquiry into the nature of authority in any community, law and the policeman are necessary. But we have also introduced a policeman into the inner world of thought and feeling. And that's something to look at. There is authority at different levels, the government, the social, the religious, and the individual authority of one's own experience. And from childhood, we are compelled to conform. In this world, obedience has been instilled by tradition, experience, and habit of obedience to one's parents, to society, to the priest. But obedience is born of fear, fear of going wrong, of acting independently, of not being secure, of not being part of the community, of standing alone, of making a mistake. You see the link between fear and authority. Question, is not authority helpful in this world of chaos and confusion? Christianity, I think it is a good question to go into. Most of us are confused, are we not? The issues of life are many and difficult, and there are innumerable specialists, teachers, gurus, innumerable books, all claiming to know the answers. Being confused, you look to those who say they know. But because you are confused, your choice of a guide will also be confused. Being anxious to find out, you invariably create authority. The authority of the book, the authority of the church, of an individual, of the collective, or an idea. So authority exists because you create it. You create it out of your own confusion and uncertainty. He continues, the anatomy of authority is the anatomy of our own uncertainty. We want to be certain, to be gratified, and so we look to someone for an answer. So our whole structure of thinking is based on authority. It is an extraordinarily compact, complex problem. What is important, surely, is not the worship of authority or the substitution of one authority for another, but rather to find out if the mind can free itself from its own confusion. The mind is very clear, it needs no authority. It's not easy for the mind to free itself from the ideas in which it has been brought up, especially with regard to psychological issues because it is ever eager to be comforted, to feel secure. So it creates or accepts some form of authority which promises the comfort it wants, an illusory reality without substance.
this notion of being secure. I feel, as Krishnamurti is pointing out, is uh, really a uh, somehow creates a need, if I can use that word, for authority. And in some ways, we think authority protects us, cushions us. He says, I know the inevitable question will arise. If we have no authority of any kind, will there not be anarchy? Of course, there may be. But does authority create order? Or does it merely create a blind following which has no meaning at all, except that it leads to destruction, to misery? If we begin to understand ourselves, then we shall also begin to understand the anatomy of authority. Then I think we shall be able to find out as individuals what is true. Put an end to sorrow, to hunger, to war. There must be a psychological revolution and few of us are willing to face that. I think those who are interested in what Krishnamurti had to say uh, are very interested in this question. And uh, perhaps this will flower more largely into the world. So a representation of authority, the authority of the state, the monks, one monk glancing at the authority of the estate, the policeman glancing back at the monk, the other monk looking straight ahead, not wanting to make eye contact. You can feel the tension in this image. the authority of culture, the authority of uh, sexism. This is in India. Uh, women protesting the sexual violence that goes on. And of course, this is not exclusive to India. Don't tell our daughter not to go out Tell your son to behave properly. Uh, this occurred because uh, some clerics and some politicians were telling women not to go out at night. That's how they're gonna fix the problem. Stay home. So deeply embedded in our cultures are are these uh, drastic, uh, really obscene notions of authority. The authority of the military industrial complex we're all pretty familiar with. And um, I think we all just accept it basically. Uh, and this is complicated. At least it's a bit complicated for me. I covered a war and I spent most of my time in the area where people had no self-defense. So uh, what Krishnamurti is really saying is this is something that is so deeply entrenched in humans that unless we get to the bottom of it, we can't fix it. And uh, 
to me, it's so stunning that we have not, as a, as a species, tried to really get to the bottom of it. We just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. He says, all living based on authority, as has been shown recently, both politically and militarily, is the most destructive form of existence. Tyranny, whether of the state or of the priest, he uses the word priest, but he means all, all do dogmatic clerics, is detrimental to thought, to a really spiritual life. And as most of us live in the cage of authority, we have lost the capacity to think clearly and directly for ourselves. And my note to this is that on the other side of our compulsion to blindly accept and follow authority is the light of understanding. First, we have to understand how we're in the thick of it most of the time and don't realize it. said, the fundamental change of which I am speaking comes when you no longer depend on any authority for the clarity of your own thinking. Authority is a very complex affair because there is not only the authority of society, the government, but also the authority of tradition. And even if you reject all that, there is still the authority of your own experience. And that experience is based on the past. So once again, a representation of authority, and I would say fear. After all, life is a process of challenge and response. And your response is the challenge, to the challenge is experience. But that experience, which is a response to challenge, is direct dictated by your conditioning, by your past. I think this is very important to understand. And this brings up something that was raised yesterday about dying. To be free of all authority of your own and of that of another is to die to everything of yesterday so that your mind is always fresh, always young, innocent, full of vigor and passion. It is only in that state that one learns and observes. And for this, a great deal of awareness is required actual awareness of what is going on inside yourself without correcting it or telling it what it should or should not be. Because the moment you correct it, you have established another authority, a censor. Also, yesterday, language came up. So does our use of language create authority and inclusion, exclusion? So let me read this. A man who wants to find out begins to inquire for himself. He does not merely accept some authority. He is an inquirer, a real seeker without any motive. He is on a journey of discovery, single, alone. And when he finds, life has quite a different significance then perhaps he may be able to help others to be free. So I can substitute the word she. Our language, the English language, is a little different in French. I know a little bit about French. But our language uses the male pronoun uses, the, you know, this is how we express things. And it's meant to be generic. It's not meant to exclude anybody. It just depends on where you're sitting, though, how you feel about this. So I, re I just changed a few words. And most of the time, Christian Murdy, you know, he's not... Uh, He's not using words in the way that they hit people today. There's a far more sensitivity around it, I think. So if you want to find out, you begin to inquire for yourself. 
you don't merely accept some authority. You are an inquirer, a real seeker, without any motive, on a journey of discovery, single alone. And when you find it, life has quite a different significance. Then perhaps you may be able to help others to be free. Be a light to yourself, a light that has no dependence on another and that is completely free. So once again, in just a moment to check in with how you're feeling. I think sometimes when we get into the discussion of gender, it can be uncomfortable. Gender and language. So, Krista Murdy on the consequences of fear. I thought we might need a, a respite and some music before diving into this aspect of our conditioning. And he's talking about psychological fear, you know, not the kind of fear if you're in the woods and you see a bear. <laughs> he said, fear is one of the greatest problems in life. Until we are free from fear, climb the highest mountain, invent every kind of God, we will always remain in darkness. One has to understand the whole question of fear, how human beings live in fear, and that fear is now becoming more and more acute because the world is becoming so dangerous a place where tyrannies are increasing, political tyrannies, bureaucratic tyrannies, denying freedom for the mind to understand, to inquire. Now he said this quite a while ago. And here we are in 2024, and every word of it rings so true. Fear is cultivated through the worship of authority. We are carefully nurtured in fear. And of course, it begins at such an early age. We have really virtually no defenses when we're young, when we're children, about this uh, atmosphere of fear. What is it that we are afraid of? We may not be consciously aware of our fear, but unconsciously we are afraid. And that unconscious fear has far greater power over our daily thoughts and activities than the effort we make to suppress or deny fear. This is really a deep dive. And one of the things that was said yesterday uh, that I had on the screen that Christian Murdy said was that this process of understanding myself, as the mind grows more quiet, the intimations from the unconscious project themselves. And we can then see deeper into what lies underneath the superficial mind, as he called it.
It was fear, fear of the present, of the future, fear of death, fear of the unknown, fear of not fulfilling, fear of not being loved. There are so many fears, all created by the machinery of thought. Yet as human beings, we are all capable of inquiry, of discovery, and this whole process is meditation. Meditation is inquiry into the very being of the meditator. You cannot meditate without self-knowledge, without being aware of the ways of your own mind, from the superficial responses to the most complex subtleties of thought. Our fear is not of the unknown, but of letting go of the known. I lead a certain kind of life. I think in a certain pattern. I have certain beliefs and dogmas, and I don't want those patterns of existence to be disturbed because I have my roots in them. I don't want them to be disturbed because the disturbance produces a state of unknowing, and I dislike that. If I am torn away from everything I know and believe, I want to be reasonably certain of the state of things to which I am going. So the brain cells have created a pattern and those brain cells refuse to create another pattern which may be uncertain. The movement from certainty to uncertainty is what I call fear. The mind can never be free of fear as long as it is making an effort to get away from fear. All it can do is be aware that it is frightened and be completely passive without any choice. Then you will see that the mind becomes extraordinarily quiet. And in that quietness, the problem of fear can be resolved. Fear is what makes us accept our conditioning. This is such a profound, profound insight. When I first came upon this one sentence, a light bulb went on. If we have an understanding of our conditioning, even that we are conditioned, you know, millions of people have not even come across something like this. And that underneath it all, it is fear what is forcing us to accept the status quo. Take a breath. Is there fear when we talk about fear? Do I want to escape this conversation? Avoid it. Or not look at how it applies in my own life. Humanity has put up with fear, has never been able to solve fear, never. Why has humanity, which is each one of us, accepted fear as a way of life, violence on television, violence in our daily life, and the ultimate violence of organized killing, which is called war? Fear has many, many branches, many leaves, but it's no good trimming the branches 
we are asking what is the root of fear, not the multiple forms of fear, because fear is fear. So fear is what makes us accept our conditioning, but what is the root? asks, what is the relationship of fear to time, to thought? One may be frightened of tomorrow or of many tomorrows, the fear of death or fear of what has happened before in the past or fear of what is actually going on now. The future is time. The present is time. Is time a central factor of fear? I have a good job now. I may lose it tomorrow, so I'm frightened. When there is fear, there is jealousy, anxiety, hatred, violence. So time is a factor of fear. Time is a factor and thought is a factor. Thinking about what has happened, what might happen, thinking. So is fear brought about by thought? Of course it is. Don't accept the speaker's word for it. Look at it. I am secure today, but I am frightened of what might happen tomorrow. There might be war. There might be some other catastrophe. So time and thought are the root of fear. And he says, time and thought are the same. They are not two separate movements. See this fact, this actuality, that time and thought, time thought, are the root of fear. Just observe it in yourself. Don't move away from the reality of it, from the truth of it, that fear is caused by time and thought. Hold it, remain with it, don't run away from it, it is so. Then it is like holding a precious jewel in your hand. You see all the beauty of that jewel. Then you will see for yourself that fear psychologically completely ends. And when there is no fear, you are free. Again, a very deep dive. And very, I think, important to look at. We could take a moment right now to bring our awareness into what I am afraid of. Depending on what comes up, just take a look. What am I afraid of? There may be many things, but is there one thing that stands out? And then to explore the root in thought, which is linked to time. It is only when the mind allows the known to fade away that there is complete freedom from the known. And then it is possible for the new impulse to come into being. To affect the whole, the part must transform itself. You and I one by one. Out of self-knowledge comes clarity. 
and then you do not rely on anybody then you are a guide to yourself a light in the midst of darkness.